it's really magnificent. I'm bringing you the other side of the story tonight, which is going to show you how magnificent you are because we were poor. <laughs> I was going to wear shoes with a hole in it just to show you how poor we were before you got all this magnificence in the bay itself. However, it all started for me and for Save the Bay on a Sunday afternoon when I was getting set to watch the National Football League game. I had the potato chips and everything else. I was ready to go and I got a phone call from a lawyer friend of mine, now deceased, Jim Holland in Tiverton, who said, there's a refinery that wants to go into Tiverton and we're having an organization meeting tonight and we'd like you to come and help us to put it together. To get me away from a National Football League game in those days was really a feat, believe me. But I agreed to go. And as the group that met in Louise Derby's house sat around the table talking about what they were going to do, I knew that in the end they were waiting for me to say, okay, I'll help you coordinate that. But I didn't really want it. I was running two campaigns for candidates for office at the same time, plus a regular little couple of clients I had. And I just couldn't find the time to do it. But I went to the meeting just because he was a good friend of mine. As we got talking around the table, I said, I knew they were going to make me an offer. And I said, uh, I can't do it. I had too many things to do. I'm sorry. Good luck. <laughs> the guy put some money on the table. He said, that's your first week's pay. All you have to do is come and set up a press conference, and we'll get a few things done, and you can go on your merry way. I looked at that money. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and not until I picked the money up. <laughs> anyway, we got through the first week and everything was fine. And somehow or other, I got imbued and infected with the enthusiasm of that group who felt that they were there to save the world. If they lost that refinery fight, you really don't know what the consequences would have been, but they would have been dire. In fact, the people who had proposed the refinery at that time admitted when it was finally defeated that had they gotten permission to put a refinery there, and in those days the state had no power to really do very much about it from what we understood, they would have made a big mess. And they admitted they would have made a big mess. When that was finally defeated, I went back to my little business and I was uh, doing okay. And I got a call from Dr. Minu, who comes from Jamestown, who said, we'd like you to come and talk to us about organizing a group we're calling Save the Bay. I said, what bay is that? Because <laughs> <laughs> I live on Mount Hope Bay. So this is Narragansett Bay and somehow or other the folks don't meet. You know, people think of one and the other and whatever. Mount Hope Bay usually gets the short end of the stick, but whatever. Which reminds me, the gentleman from doing a power that got a plaque tonight for getting cooling towers created. I convinced them at one time when I was with Save the Bay that they needed a cooling pond to send sprays of hot water that they were filling into the air so it could cool off. And they did that. And what happened? When the sprays went up the air, blew all the damn lights out and all the summer sets were falling out. <laughs> so thank God you're going to have the towers which I assume will be directed somewhere that won't blow out all the lights. <laughs> I never got forgiven for that. <laughs> but in any event, we got started with Save the Bay and, and Dr. Miner and John Canula and Charlie McGowan sat in there little house. And in any event, we got started and they found a little office in East Greenwich. When you look at this palatial surroundings here, that little office in, in East Greenwich was one room about this size. We made a second room once later so we could house Trudy in there. <laughs> <laughs> and we had that $6,000 to get started. And they sent me out to buy used furniture. There was a guy, Carter or something, he used to have a warehouse and he went for furniture. And I bought a couple of wooden desks, I mean really wooden desks. 
and a chair for me. <laughs> that chair was not balanced. <laughs> when I slide back with that chair, boom, <laughs> on the floor. So when you talk about hot knocks, I actually got them. <laughs> that was the beginning. We sat there for a long time. And Dr. Minor called me up and said, I met a young lady at a cocktail party named Trudy Cox. I want you to interview her and to be your assistant. I said, we got $6,000. <laughs> he said, well, don't, don't hire her that way. Let her do the newsletter or something and give her a couple of bucks. So I figured I better go see Trudy Cox. I went to see Trudy Cox, and at that time she was a not a milking maid, what do you call them? A Quaker. She was a Quaker, Quaker guy in Newport. She was sitting in the pew there when I went to see her. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> anyway, she agreed to come and get paid just to do the newsletter, but I didn't realize what a demanding young lady she was. <laughs> All the women I had had in my life to that day were very subservient. <laughs> And I found out that didn't rule the world very much before, so we got along all right. Trudy was very talented. She did a great job. Well, I was there. She did a better job after I left. <laughs> <laughs>